Welcome back to Let's Regroup, where we hope to build stronger citizens. About two weeks ago, I promised to bring you a bit of a comparison and contrast of the Nicaragua conflict and today's fight against terrorism. If you have not listened to that audio, and I am sorry that some of it is scratchy, but you know, if you don't have your headset in, you could probably get through it. And I really do recommend you actually listen to it because it ties history and this current bill together. The link is posted in the comment section to give you where you can go and return to it. As of now, predict.gov has given this bill, HR 258, a 2% chance of passing, when at the beginning of this week, on Monday, when I first checked it, it was at 9%. So it's kind of falling. In review of whether or not the new bill introduced last year and then reintroduced this year, would be effective in stopping terrorists, the Boland Amendment was cited as having been effective resolving the Contra conflict. What we saw last video was that, well, yeah, it was after we finally told North that he couldn't do anything and we got him out of the, out of the way from funding them. So upon reviewing the material, however, this team, Let's Regroup team, has found that there are some problems with using the two in comparison. On the surface, it's easy to say that the Contra numbers are significantly different and those in, than those in various terrorist organizations. However, even if we scale the numbers, there's still a huge issue. To give you an idea, in 1989, an opinion piece in the New York Times written by someone I have no idea who, because it didn't actually say who it was, had this to say. What, in fact seriously weakened the rebel cause was excessive dependence on U.S. aid. Some Contra leaders seemed to act as if the Sadanista propaganda was true, that an imperial Washington would never allow the insurgents to fail. New York Times Opinion, August 20th, 1989. In contrast, the Islamic State and other Islamic terrorist organizations <laughs> <laughs> have moved towards a much different method of generating revenue. They do this by being businessmen. And with the reach of millions in comparison to the numbers of the Contras in the Nicaragua, this tells us that bleeding their funds will prove far more difficult. To give you an idea of this, in 2014, the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, David Cohen, reported that ISIL had, quote, amassed wealth at an unprecedented pace and its revenue sources have a different composition from those of many other terrorist organizations. Unlike, for instance, core al-Qaeda, ISIL derives a relatively small share of funds from deep pocket donors and thus does not today depend principally on moving money across international borders. Instead, ISIL obtains the vast majority of its revenues through local criminal and terrorist activities, unquote. And I will give you where you can read up on his entire thoughts from treasury.gov in the comment section. As organizations learn to take tricks from other organizations across the world, such as the mafia or even other terrorist organizations, we will have to get more creative in how we address the problem. When the Bolin Amendments went through, the greatest problem America faced was enforcing the rules set forth. As stated earlier, we had to get rid of Oliver North and his ideas. Or, you know, yeah, depending on who you want to completely blame on that. The Bolin Amendments were very much reduced from what Representative Gabbard has put forth in her Stop Arming Terrorist Bill, also known as H.R. 258. The Bolin Amendments were actually reduced mostly because the Democrats could not re convince the Republican Party that the conflict in Nicaragua was not going to be resolved by funding the Contras. The other part was, well, we wanted communists to fail. So, the Republicans, wanting to see that happen, were determined to fund the Contras in order to keep communism from getting around our borders. Well, that's very much different from today. We know that regardless of party, no one in Congress, well, at least if they truly represent us, the people, wants to see any organization in the region win. 
We might have one we'd prefer to fight, Al-Qaeda, but ultimately the end game is to see all terrorist organizations squashed. Which brings us back to HR 258. The money that would be taken from these organizations may not be enough to stop them, but we can probably at least agree that taking even one dollar out of the hands of a terrorist organization, it's one dollar less than that they have to figure out how they're going to make up. But more importantly, at least America will not be will will be able to say that we have done everything in our power to keep our money out of the hands of terrorists and we can hopefully put it back into our system. Now, for those of you that are still worried about the humanitarian factor, that the money will be reduced in trying to help people that truly need it, it's my message to you that you can't have both. Just like the horrifying decision that we had to make in Japan, where it was drop the bombs, or not drop the bombs, we have to make a decision on what is more humane, trying to stop terrorists from disrupting lives of others or knowingly prolonging the horrific suffering of people in the region and innocent lives across the world as we watch incidents like 9-11 or Paris happen again and again until it becomes our normal. If you support a bill that will keep American funds out of the hands of terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, I urge you to write our Congress and let them know that, you, that they need to continue working on H.R. 258 and push it into law. I will personally be writing my letter this weekend and possibly working to tweak it over the course of next week until I can finally get it and send it forward. Also, I would encourage you to stay tuned as my team here at Let's Regroup follows its evolution. Thank you for listening, and let's work together to awaken the night within.